is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Today's episode is thanks to our Patreon members and our affiliates and partners. Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to join our membership or donate to the podcast and stay tuned to hear about some amazing deals and discounts from our partners, including Prevenix, Inside Tracker, Orgain, Practice Better, and Jen and Carrie. But for now, we're getting right to the show. Enjoy. Hello, fans and listeners. Welcome back to another episode. It's Lindsay Cortez here, your host of the podcast, owner and sports dietitian at Rise Up Nutrition. I'm here today with our amazing reoccurring guest, Dr. Nikki Kay. She's a medical doctor with expertise in the field of exercise endocrinology. Graduating from Cambridge University, she is honorary clinical lecturer in the Division of Medicine, University College London. Nikki's clinical and research endocrine work is particularly with exercisers, dancers, and athletes with a focus on relative energy deficiency in sport, known as Red S, and with women experiencing perimenopause and menopause. Her book, Hormones, Health, and Human Potential, A Guide to Understanding Your Hormones to Optimize Your Health and Performance, was released in 2022. It's a valuable resource and read for all of us. And Dr. K has been on our podcast before. She was on episode number 38 and episode number 98. So please go check those out. Dr. K, welcome back. (laughs) Thank you very much for having me back. Yeah. And so since you've been on the podcast before and we've talked, we've done deep dives into the role of hormones in red S and just the role of hormones in general, I thought today we would get a little specific and (laughs) talk about the thyroid hormones specifically, because as I shared with you, (laughs) I find the thyroid hormones very confusing. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's true. I listen, I agree with you. So yeah, let's uh, try and unpack it and get down to the uh, the details and deconfuse. <laughs> yes, deconfuse. It's it's every time I get those thyroid numbers and I'm looking at blood work of a client, I I have to like reopen my books and mm-hmm. re-educate myself every single time. It's very confusing. So that's what our episode is going to focus on. And let's kick it off with you just telling us what are the thyroid hormones and the main function of the thyroid you know gland that's producing those hormones in our body. Sure. So the thyroid gland is located here in the neck. It's like a butterfly gland. And that gland is producing thyroxin, T4, mm-hmm. and tri- thyronine, I can never say it properly, T3. Right, okay, T4 and T3. And there is more T4 than T3 because T3 is actually like super, the super active one. They're both produced by the thyroid gland, but there's also some degree of conversion of T4 to T3 peripherally in the tissues. So, so far, so good, right? Mm-hmm. And also, what's, what the, what's the function of these hormones? They control metabolic rate. Metabolic rate is the, effectively the rate at which you burn through energy, I suppose you could say. Like, what rev count have you got on your car, you know? And where have you got the thermostat turned up to sort of thing, sort of thing, right? So they control the rate at which you burn through your food, food convert it. But they have other effects on the body, um, you know, like with many hormones, Many hormones have one sort of major role, but then they have lots of other ones and no difference for the thyroid gland hormones. Thyroxin and T3 have also uh, an important role for bone health, for example. We know that estradiol is the queen when it comes to bone health, but nevertheless, T3 have a look in and uh, T4 and T3, they also help with uh, bone health. So they just keep the metabolic rate, hopefully, in equilibrium, just at the right where you need it personally for you, okay? Mm -hmm. And they might respond 
if you eat a little bit more, they will increase the metabolic rate and vice versa, by the way, because so, they're responding. And how are they going to do that? Well, now we have to refer to the master controller of all the hormones, the conductor of the endocrine orchestra, the pituitary gland. Yes. That's located in the brain. Even in this hierarchy, even above that, there's hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is another, it's an endocrine gland, but it's, it's got a really amazing role. It keeps an eye on everything that's going on outside your body. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like keeps a watching brief on how much exercise you're doing, what are you eating, what are you, what's going on in your life, what's stressful and et cetera. But also it keeps an eye on what's happening inside your body mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how's your body, you know, what shapes it in, how, how's it, how's it looking? Is there enough energy to go around? How are the bones looking, et cetera, et cetera. So it sort of combines all this information, the hypothalamus, and then it's very close to the pituitary gland, the conductor of the endocrine orchestra, and then it sort of translates all that information to a message to the pituitary to say, right, if we're talking specifically about the thyroid gland, the pituitary gland will release what's called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, so TSH will be released by the pituitary and that will control the levels of uh, here in the gland, in the gland, the amount of T4 and T3 released. And it's one of these negative feedback loops, which is typical, really sort of like the classic thing for all hormones, because it's this uh, like Goldilocks. You don't want it too hot. You don't want it too hot. You know, want it just in the right level. Mm -hmm. But how do you do that? Uh, it's, it is this feedback loop. So let me explain a little bit more. So the TSH signal will go to the thyroid gland to produce T4 and T3. But what happens if the gland gets very enthusiastic and starts producing quite a lot of T4 and T3? Mm -hmm. And then the hypothalamus will notice that. It's like, well, hold on a minute. The metabolic rate is now too fast, right? Okay. Uh, and so then it will say to the pituitary gland, hold on. <laughs> Just dampen down that, bring down that level of the TSH message being sent to the thyroid gland. And so that becomes less and therefore it will produce less. Mm -hmm. So it will, it, it's like blood glucose control. Yeah. You know, if you measure it in real time, blood glucose goes up and down. This is on a very, blood glucose is the obvious one because it's really quite very, uh, you know, very tightly with time. So it will go up and down, but on average, it stays in the middle. The same for the thyroid hormones. On average, we want it, the body's aiming to keep it in the healthy range. So that's really what it is. So what the key things you need to remember are that TSH is the hormone that controls the thyroid gland from the pituitary gland. Yep. And the, the thyroid gland produces T4 and T3. And the main action of those hormones is to control your metabolic rate, but also some good spin-offs for bone health and, and other things. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. That was so helpful. And so I think focusing on this metabolic rate for a moment, we have a lot of I don't know, like fluff sayings when it comes to the nutrition field of like boost your metabolism, you know, by eating, I don't even know, X, Y, and Z. <laughs> and I think, could you give us like a, like you said, the, the thyroid, it's that negative feedback loop. So yes, your metabolism, if you eat more, mm -hmm. metabolism will increase. If you eat less, metabolism will decrease, but it also tries to regulate it very tightly. How like, People can change their metabolic rate over time, but how, like, realistically, if somebody was to, let's, let's just do a hypothetical scenario that maybe they've, they have been under eating somewhat and over time slowed their metabolic rate. And now they begin to fuel better, nourish better, eat more to hopefully boost their metabolic rate. Is there some sort of like realistic? timeline as to how quickly you can actually change your metabolic rate? I mean, unlike blood glucose, which is very, you know, quick, the thyroid gland is a little bit more slower paced. Mm -hmm. For example, if we, in a medical situation, if we give someone thyroxine, we'll come on to that, why well, you might want to give that. But I say, listen, we're not going to repeat the blood test for at least six weeks. So it takes, okay. it definitely, that's the absolute minimum time. But just to pick up on your point, that the thyroid gland, more specifically, I suppose we could say the hypothalamus, reacts to how much you're eating. And if you're not eating much, quite sensibly, it will say, well, we need to actually save energy and keep everything on the, the down low mm -hmm. and reduce metabolic rate, which, by the way, is what frustrates some people because you think, well, if I eat less and I maybe do more exercise, I'm going to be an energy deficit. Math says, surely now I should lose weight, right? Right, right. 
You might do at first, but then you will typically come to a plateau where you can't lose any more weight. And I'll tell you why, because the body isn't stupid. Or more to the point, the, the hormones aren't stupid and the thyroid isn't stupid. And it's, uh, it's adapting. Yeah. Because from evolution point of view, people m- might not have been able to eat much if there was a, you know, they couldn't get their, they couldn't kill their saber toothed tiger or they couldn't, you know, there was a, they couldn't get enough food. So right. the body will have to instinctively slow the use, the rate of use of this energy. So that's, it's doing what it should do, by the way. But then that leaves you frustrated nowadays. If we flash forward to nowadays, right? You know, it's like, well, why? Why am I eating less and less? But I'm still, I can't lose weight. I've just plateaued because the thyroid, and the metabolic rate slowed down. But then, as you say, if you now start to eat a bit more, mm-hmm. then the the hypothalamus will say, okay, now we're in business, right? Now, now we've got something. So let's tell the pituitary, yes, you can increase that. A TSH a little bit, you see, but that won't, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. It will take a minimum, minimum of six weeks. Of course, it depends how slow it's gone. Right. You know, how, how far you have to go. You know, if you've run your, your petrol tank really low in, in the car, then of course it's going to take longer to fill it up again, sort of thing. So it will take some time for it to reboot, but don't worry. It will. If you've got an intact hormone network, the body is amazing. It will, it will do that and adapt for you. And you have to kind of trust it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that it, it's, it knows what to do. It's had uh, millions of years of practice, right? Right, right. Yeah. I think that that's so helpful. And that's one of the reasons why people, you know, even if they are looking for some moderate weight loss, healthier lifestyle, metabolic changes, the idea or notion of just continuing to cut down your calories just doesn't work. And, and long term, it just, you know, it just hurts the thyroid more and hurts your metabolism more. So, really finding, understanding that people, you might make some changes, maybe it does involve eating a little bit less or differently, but you also kind of have to then, you know, not keep doing that chronically long term. Well, exactly. It's the the old yo-yo diet, but also you have to do it sort of stealthily. Yeah, because you don't want to be going back and forth. No, 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 no. Well, so so yeah. you just, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, just almost like the uh, try and trick the hypothalamus more. It's just, uh, just a little bit, right? Right. Just a little deficit. Okay. Just a little bit, little small deficit mm-hmm. and maybe not even, even continuous. You will give it a little deficit and that, you know what I mean? Just very, very gradual mm-hmm. and like that. But if you do the sudden the crash the diet quick results, yeah. that, well, exactly that, you know, all, this is sold as the quick result, quick, whatever. If it's, if, if it's selling that, then just be really, really uh, cautious. It might, it might do initially, but as you say, then it will just rebound. And then every single time the thyroid, you know, the, the, you can understand the hypothalamus thyroid is like, honestly, what's going on here? It gets yeah. a bit confused. So you can understand that's not the best way to do it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so. So hopefully our listeners really listen to that. Just one more message of not doing that crash diet and not being in an energy deficit for too long. And then also as you're making dietary changes, be it increasing your calories, decreasing your calories, um, knowing that it takes, you know, at least six weeks for that thigh minimum for that thyroid minimum, to respond. For, uh, for it to, Could take longer. Yeah. Exactly. For the hormones to respond, but then it will take even lo- longer for those hormones to have a, a biological effect. Oh, true. You see, right. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yep. So, okay. Yep. The, if you measure the blood test, it looks a little bit better. Yeah. Where it should be, you expect it to be, but then there's still sort of a, like a backlog of all the various cells that the mm-hmm. thyroxin was, uh, you know, uh, giving <laughs> servicing. I was going to say, I don't know quite the right word, but anyway, a biological response for those cells to also catch up. Right. But in right. terms of metabolic rates and all this sort of thing, I think it's, the nutrition is the obvious one. That's the energy you put in, but also the energy you put out through the exercise mm-hmm. and also the type of exercise. And this is why, you know, I have to be honest with you, a little secret here. I don't <laughs> like doing strength training. I don't I go to the gym. I don't like lifting weights. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Yeah. But I do do some, I try and do other strength in other ways. I'm a Pilates teacher, resistant bands. Anyway, whatever. So. But nevertheless, doing that sort of strength work rather than just endless cardio yes. is actually helpful because when you do the strength work, you're going to engage a lot of your muscles, yeah. right, your whole body. And also in the muscles are the most metabolically active because they have mitochondria in them that are gobble up, mm-hmm. <laughs> gobble up energy, right, and convert it to muscular energy, movement energy, etc. So that's the little top tip. 
yes, you can, we talk about the nutrition, but also think about how you're using that energy and don't look just to do cardio all the time. Do some sort of strength work that suits you because that will increase the the muscles, increase. So that's great because you get more muscles, right? Number one, body composition, but also those muscles will have more mitochondria, more metabolically active, you see? Mm -hmm. And that continues even after you stop the exercise. It's like, great. So you do your strength work, whatever it is, and you're using lots of energy, metabolic rate, hooray. But then also afterwards, because the muscles now want replenishing to replenish their glycogen stores, etc. So that, so remember there's the nutrition side of it and also the type of exercise the muscle you're doing. And exercise yeah, yeah, the muscle side, yeah. especially, yeah. Hey fans, I hope you are enjoying this conversation so far and we'll be back to it in just a moment. But first, I want to pause and let you know that this episode is brought to you by the Female Athlete System of Transformation aka the fast track to overcome disordered eating and use food as fuel to perform at your highest level. The female athlete system of transformation is my unique program and proven systems to guide female athletes to understanding and implementing the proper nutrition for their sport, life, and health. Myself and my team of registered sports dietitians work one-on-one with clients to address their unique needs and counsel them through the nutritional and behavioral changes needed. Many female athletes who resonate with disordered eating, mental guilt around food and body, relative energy deficiency in sport or female athlete triad, amenorrhea, repeat injuries due to negligent nutrition, or frankly, just a lack of knowledge and understanding on their fueling needs have seen incredible success in the fast track. After years of working as a sports RD, I've compiled the most effective ways for female athletes to learn nutrition, be supported, be challenged, and ultimately find their success with fueling as fast as possible. So don't wait another day. Get to your goals faster by joining the Female Athlete System of Transformation. Look in the show notes or head to the website to book a free call and learn more. Okay, now let's get you back to the conversation. Enjoy. Yeah, I really cool. I kind of being a student got firsthand experience with that throughout my undergrad, graduate studies. And then throughout my 20s and my first few jobs as a dietitian, I continued to have access for my clients of metabolic testing and would do it on myself periodically. Yeah. And this was also so from age, you know, let's say 20 to 26 or 20. Yeah, around 20 to 26 or 28 or something. I was every couple of years doing metabolic testing on myself. And throughout this time, I also was getting stronger. Mm. I was working side by side with wonderful strength coaches at different universities and organizations I was working with. And I, I always picked their brains and yeah, yeah. had them put me on strength training programs. And I did build muscle throughout that. that time in my life too. Mm. And it was really cool to actually see that my resting metabolic rate did increase throughout those years. But I also, I do want, this is just my personal experience, Mm -hmm. but I also do want to share with listeners, like, that's so cool that I increased my resting metabolic rate through building more muscle, but it also was still a kind of small amount. Like, I think over the course of those six years, there's like 250 calories, you know? True. No, it wasn't massive, but it certainly, (laughs) every little bit helps. Yes. Yes. And by the way, maybe we should just clarify, Lindsay, do you think, um, you know, what do we mean by resting metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate? Because these are words that will be banded around. Yeah, let's do that. Resting metabolic rate, if you lie in bed all day, I don't know many people can do that. Um, but anyway, if you were to lie in bed all day, you're still going to burn through a lot of energy just to stay alive. Mm-hmm. You might sort of get up and move a little bit. So you might go to the toilet, but just very, very minimal. Okay. Resting. That's how much energy you need as a human being to stay alive, just not even doing any extra activity. Right. And by the way, resting metabolic rate is higher for men than women. Mm-hmm. Right. They're much more wasteful. No, no, seriously. It's because they do have more muscle mass. Mm-hmm. See, this goes back to the muscle mass thing. So that's why you have a man and a woman lying and you'll measure and the resting metabolic rate will automatically be higher for the man because it will have more muscle uh, than the woman. And we said that muscle is more metabolically active. So that's resting metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate is a term you might come across. And that means literally you have been sort of rested overnight uh, and like the extreme of rested, if you sort of mean. Yeah. Like just doing nothing. Uh, um, so anyway, but, but, but for practical terms, I normally we say resting metabolic rate yeah. because 
you know, we can't expect someone to be absolutely stationary for a day and then we know, you know, it's just not practical. So, so that's the resting metabolic rate. But you're right. Nevertheless, if you improve your uh, body composition and get more muscle, as you say, it's a modest yes. increase in metabolic rate. But listen, we're not going to sniff at it. Right. It's something. It was something, yeah. And you feel, you feel positive. And also it's not mm-hmm. just because you want to increase your resting metabolic rate. It's also because having more muscle is good. Yeah, you're strong. So, yes, you can so strong. Lift up, lift up mm-hmm. small children, right? Yes. And, and do yes. things like this, right? And, yeah. and shopping and, and, you know, just for your everyday life. And also, you know, muscle is more dense than mm-hmm. fat. So actually, even though you might weigh the same on the scales, you know, rather than getting fixated on this measurement of gravity, anyway, you know, that's my little thing. Right. Actually, if your body composition has changed, in other words, you've got a slimmer waist because that's more, you're more muscular, you see? Right. right. Because it's denser, then that's a good thing. So yeah, but it's, it's, as you say, it's all lots of extra little bits along the way. Why doing some sort of strength training, whatever that looks like for you, is a good thing for metabolic rate, but also actually it's got other benefits as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's shift over then to these terms that people have probably heard a lot. Hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroid, hyperthyroidism, and hypo. So that's when we've got hyper, meaning an overactive thyroid producing too much thyroid hormone, and then hypothyroidism producing too little. But again, it's like, well, in a, in a normally functioning body, this should be tightly regulated. So, how does one even get into a state of hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism? Hmm. So those are medical conditions. I mean, the body is amazing. And as you know, I, I think the hormones are especially amazing. But yeah. but nevertheless, we know that sometimes things go wrong, right? So there should be this tightly regulated the negative feedback loop, homeostasis, everything nicely in equilibrium. But if there's a problem with the thyroid gland itself, Hmm. then, yeah, that's when things get out of kilter. So, for example, hyperthyroidism means where the thyroid gland gland gets too enthusiastic. It stops responding to the control signals from the pituitary gland and it does its own sweet, merry thing. It starts getting really enthusiastic and starts producing way too much thyroxin. So, hence the word hyper. Right. You know, you imagine someone hyper, what, do, what image do you conjure up? So these are all the tests you see, you put your hands out and they're trembling and your brain's buzzing. And, and, you know, because there's too much thyroxin, that can even affect the bone health. It can make that, uh, you know, not so good, right? Cause it's a big turnover. Everything is sped up, metabolic rate increased. That's a medical condition. There's like a fault in the thyroid gland. It just goes, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, it does its own thing. And so if you look at the blood tests for someone like that, you will see the T4 and T3 very high, uh-huh. but you will see the TSH very low. Because it's trying not to produce because more. It's trying, because because the, the, th- the hypothalamus and the pituitary are saying, what the heck? Yeah. They're saying, look, please don't, <laughs> don't produce so much. And so that's why you see the TSH low, suppressed, and you see the T4 and T3 high. So it's a mismatch. So that's overactive thyroid, and that's all the signs of the person, right? Typically, you would say that, oh, they because they're speeding up the metabolic rate, they would lose weight, typically. Mm-hmm. However, I've also seen it actually where the person is now so hungry that they might even put on weight. So it depends. It's not a yeah. clear-cut sign. But so basically behaviors they feel, play a huge yeah, role. Yeah, so, yeah so. exactly. But basically, they feel uncomfortable. They feel really on edge and, you know, not good. And for women's periods, we'll come on to this later, but, you know, these hormones are all interacting. So a woman might also report that her periods have become very spaced out and light, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so that, those are the things that can also, so that's overactive thyroid. There is a sort of a subtype of hyperthyroidism called Graves disease. Yes. Right. So yeah. why does the thyroid gland get too enthusiastic? As with most, some of these things, the honest answer is we don't know. You know, there's all sorts of ifs and buts, uh, you know, maybe, a virus uh, gets tickles up the thyroid. Maybe it's a genetic thing. We don't know, really. Yeah. But there is a specific thing called Graves' disease where you produce antibodies to hype up the thyroid gland. Really weird, okay? Yeah. I mean, listen, this is a slight digression, but autoimmune disease in general, which is what does that mean? It means you produce antibodies to your own tissues, right? Mm-hmm. Especially more common in women than men in general terms. I actually have an autoimmune disease. I have rheumatoid arthritis 
So for some strange reason, my body's taken a dislike to the synovial lining of my joints. Yeah. Strange and really annoying. Anyway, (laughs) I digress. But so we don't honestly know why, what graves, what's the origin of graves disease, like we say, genetics, viral, we don't know, but yeah, the net result is yes, you will have the overactive thyroid, but also the, these antibodies for some strange reason can affect the eye. Oh, yeah. So when you have got an overactive thyroid, the person literally is like, you know, big eyes. <laughs> uh, big eyes. Yeah. And so you can see the whites of the eyes above the, the iris, right? Yeah. You know, most people, your lid will be there, but like, imagine like, I'm like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also with the Graves disease, the eyes actually stick out. Wow. Because the antibodies attack the muscle. Wow. And yet the muscles all inflamed. And so in the worst case, actually the movement of the eyes. When you ask the person to move the eyes from side to side, because it's all inflamed, they kind of get stuck. Uh, anyway, so that's sort of a subtype yeah. of overactive thyroid, Graves' disease, which people might have come across. Yeah. So, so you can have just hyperthyroidism for unknown reasons because yeah, yeah. things happen in the body, or it could be this autoimmune Graves disease, disease where you're, yeah, Graves' disease. Yeah, with an extra, which is an extra level of the eye complication, which is obviously worrying. Right. Yeah. That's worrying. Right. Mm. Right. And so obviously with, with, you know, these autoimmune diseases, disease states, is this where, you know, medication comes in and, and can, does that help with Graves' disease? Does it help with the general hyperthyroidism? So hyperthyroidism, what you do, you have to give medication to stop the thyroid gland being so over, over enthusiastic. Yeah. It's a very complicated metabolic pathway, so I, I'm afraid I can't explain it to you. It's but okay. all I know is that the drug, I know what the drug name is, carbibazole, there you go, I know that, <laughs> right? I know, all I know is we give the person this uh, this drug that stops them producing the uh, so much T4, and, and then it should calm it down. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's again, it's such a tricky one. You know, that's why you have to monitor the, the person very carefully because it might be you should, you can start with the dose and then you can gradually tail it off. And sometimes that will sort of stabilize it mm-hmm. or sometimes you might have to just, they might have to stay on that. And sometimes at that point, the person gets really fed up and they say, look, I don't want to take these tablets. Yeah. So another possibility is sounds a bit drastic, but you can knock out the thyroid gland. And you swallow oh. a capsule of radioactive iodine wow. and it knocks out the thyroid gland because, you know, it can be problematic if you've got an overactive thyroid and it can be really tricky sometimes to control with the carbimazole and you're going up and down with the dose and mm-hmm. it's, it's a headache for, for, for the person. So, yeah. so that's a possibility. There are other things for the Graves disease. You know, sometimes if the eyes get really, really bad, you might even need surgery. But anyway, mm-hmm. you know, we'll see. So medication is, is, is the answer. The treatment, yeah. The, the yeah. treatment. So that's the overactive thyroid. Should we do the yeah. underactive one yeah, now? Absolutely. Let's switch so there. That was hyper. Now we're doing hypo, which is underactive thyroid. Mm-hmm. So same principle that the thyroid gland, again, we don't always understand why, basically sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> throws in the towel and stops producing so much thyroxine. So on the blood test, you'll see low T4 and T3, but the pituitary gland and hypothalamus, very cross. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So they're going to increase the TSH. Mm-hmm. So now you're going to look at the blood test and you're going to say TSH very high. You're going to see T4 and T3 inappropriately or unexpectedly low. In the UK, and I believe in the UK, US, what level of TSH are you looking for? Certainly here in the UK, we say that that's 10 international mm-hmm. units per milliliter, right? And the ab- this is these it depends on the units because I know you guys over there sometimes use strange units. Um, <laughs> anyway, let me give you in, in England I've got this number in my head that like it's uh, 0.1 TSH 0.1 to 4.5. And so in the overactive thyroid, remember the TSH will be very low, yeah. so it'll be le- even low, low. But if you've got a high TSH, and certainly when you get to that cutoff of 10, like really high, yeah. it's like okay, we've got a problem. We need to do something. And how will the person feel and look? So just as the other person will be hyped, the other one will be, you know, really lethargic, tired, feeling cold, typically putting on weight because the met- metabolic rate slowed down. Mm-hmm. And for women, periods tend to get very heavy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So those are the things with that. And the autoimmune thing also, uh, you know, raises its head again. Similarly, why is the thyroid gland packed in? It could be, again, an autoimmune disease. Mm-hmm. Hashimoto's, mm-hmm. thyroiditis, which is a strange one because again, what triggers it? Virus, maybe, we don't know. Anyway. Yeah. You'll see, if you do the autoantibodies, you'll see that those particular ones, um, what's called anti-TPO, 
sarroxin peroxidase will be high. And what can happen in Hashimoto's is initially actually the thyroid gland will be overactive. It's like it's released all its hormone. So it might go up a bit and then it will crash down. It will become very underactive. So you have to sort of watch that pattern. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so now you've got somebody who's got an underactive thyroid, TSH is very high and they're feeling miserable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what do you do? Guess what? You give thyroxine replacement. And this is for life because, you know, the gland has pretty much permanently, you know, retired. So yeah, that's, I think those are the main things to say about those two conditions. Oh, by the way, one extra little thing is these autoimmune diseases in general are more common in women, including the thyroid. Okay. And also, by the way, relevant in pregnancy, Mm. uh, if you, it will, it can, if you haven't got the dose of thyroxine correct, or you have got an overactive thyroid, it can, uh, number one, affect fertility, because I've said the periods will be a Mm. little bit. Right, right. What, but if you've got somebody, a woman who is on thyroxine and she becomes pregnant, here in the UK anyway, we see that, that woman in the medical antenatal clinic because we might have to increase her thyroxine during pregnancy because obviously there's a bigger demand, right? Yeah. You see. Anyway, um, that's just a sort of slight uh, aside, I guess. Well, those are the nuances, you know, those this is the, the female athlete nutrition podcast. And those are some, you know, nuances. But between... That's an extra thing. Pregnancy is another extra yeah. thing. Yeah. Going back to the hypothyroid, the underactive, mm-hmm. the autoimmune one. What I do see sometimes, Lindsay, is that sometimes people get the antibodies tested and they might be a little bit high, but the thyroid function, the TSH and T4 are entirely normal. Okay. Personally, I'm not comfortable starting on that person on thyroxine at that point in time. Okay. It does give you an indication. It says, look, you've got some antibodies knocking around, so we need to keep an eye on it. But I think sometimes starting thyroxine too soon when you don't need it, it might be you will need it, Mm -hmm. right? But it's a case of watching and and giving the thyroxine when you need it. And certainly, you know, there are downsides to taking thyroxine when you don't need it. Because it's like over revving the car. Right. Salazar, need I say more? You know that coach, this great coach? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, he wasn't actually banned because of thyroxine, because thyroxine isn't on the WADA ban list, mm-hmm. because they are assuming that <laughs> doctors will only prescribe it when it's needed. But right. he was using it in a n- not so scrupulous way. People with totally normal thyroid measurements, but it. giving it to speed up their metabolic rate, thinking maybe this will help them you know, stay a low weight. Right. But then we have a concern that, you know, like I said, as someone with an overactive thyroid, in the long term, it could be bad for your bone health. Anyway, the point is you don't take, you don't mess with your hormones, by the way. And and I think also just knowing, you know, you don't want to take medications unnecessarily. There no, are, you know, side that? effects no, and consequences of that. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I, you know, I think it's a good point of, okay, just because I have these antibodies, let's still, you know, we don't have, like, because in the case of of uh, Hashimoto's or something like you said, the, the thyroxine medication would be necessary for life. So it's something that yeah, it's a commitment. If it's true, if, you truly need it. If it's true, it. it's a commitment. And so you know, it's worth really exploring, getting those second opinions, looking at everything to know is this really true? Do I really need this? Because if you can delay it or you know not need medication, it's just getting the timing right of it. You know, yeah. just like anything like HRT. You know, you might need it in the in the future but you know the timing of it yeah you, you want to make that right and we do cover that there's a thing called subclinical mm-hmm. hypothyroidism so where your tsh is a little bit higher i'm just giving you our ranges in the uk right but yep and it also will depend from lab to lab but say let for argument's sake let's say the upper range is 4.5 mm-hmm. and the nice guidelines it's 10 so what happens if you're somewhere in between that? Yeah, like what six. What happens if you're, you're six <laughs> or seven and and you've got positive antibodies? Then I am going to be saying to you, we need to keep an eye on this. Keep an eye on let's it. Repeat, yeah. Let's repeat this in two months or whatever the timescale is, we think, mm-hmm. because probably if it's going to move that way, then we'll be on it. So that's the thing. That's the thing people should remember. It's a case of monitoring these things. Yeah. And also as you get older, <laughs> unfortunately, as you get older, <laughs> Uh, things do get a little bit not work so well. And, uh, that includes the thyroid. And okay. we know that as you get older, your TSH starts to creep up a little bit. Okay. Basically, because the thyroid is just like a little bit tired. 
but you know mine is hovering you know it can be sort of five-ish like that mm -hmm. you know like that but I, I monitor it I only do it actually every year in fact I must do another one anyway you know but it sort of hangs out around there yeah uh, and and that's okay but if it started to creep then it's like, okay, now, so that's the other really important thing to say. I think with any measurement, Lindsay, any measurement we can, whatever it is, tracking it, uh, tracking it, keeping an eye on mm -hmm. it, seeing what direction it's going in, up or down or staying yeah. stable. Everything has a little bit of wiggle because, especially with hormones, because that's their nature. Like we said, it's this negative feedback. It's, it, it is, has got a little bit of variation. It's not a perfect line like that. Thanks to Inside Tracker, I can get insights and feedback on my blood biomarkers whenever I want to. No more waiting for doctor's visits and them telling you, you're fine. Instead, you are in control of your health with Inside Tracker. For 20% off any of their products, blood biomarker testing, DNA kit, inner age, head to insidetracker.com and use the code RISEUP. Take your health into your own hands. Health, wellness, and fitness coaches, listen up. Practice Better is the all-in-one platform that I use to manage my business and my clients. From client scheduling and messaging, hosting sessions, taking notes, creating modules, invoicing, telehealth, building reports, and more, Practice Better is the better way to manage your practice as a nutrition or health or fitness coach. Look no further. Use the link in our show notes and use the code Rise up 20 for 20% 20 off your first four months plus a 14 day free trial. I've been using Practice Better since the inception of my business, Rise Up Nutrition, and I couldn't be happier. Again, the code is Rise Up 20, all caps. Use the link in our show notes for 20% 20 off your first four months and a 14 day free trial. Let's get back to the episode. exactly what I was thinking as you were talking. I was like, you know, it's it's not so much just about what is the number, but it's those trends over time. And exactly, so I think exactly. it's a it's a good reminder for people to, you know, get probably yearly blood work and mm, pending exactly. what's going on maybe more often. But yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a good reminder there. Now the other specialty that you and I both have in our own regards is dealing with relative energy deficiency in sport, red S. And that though we can heal from red S. So, you know, our hope is that if you have red S, this is a temporary thing because you can heal and overcome it. But that can also a, a huge part of red S is that our hormones are yeah, out yeah. of whack, our endocrine systems out of whack. And so can you shed some light for our listeners on how thyroid might be affected if you're in a state of red S. And then again, since I just said you can heal from red S, does your thyroid heal as well? Mm. I mean, the good news about, you know, reds at a low energy availability is that, as you say, you can overcome this, you know, uh, and restore your hormone health. Mm -hmm. Because what's happened is going back to the sort of the basics, what is it? It's when you get an imbalance in your behaviors. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you aren't fueling sufficiently to cover all your demands and that has an impact on your hormones, your hormones respond and adapt. So, by the way, you know, my other little pet thing, it's not the hormones have got out of balance. <laughs> it's I'm afraid it's you. <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry, guys. She's saying you know, that with you, a big you, grin on her face. I'm afraid yeah, it's well, you. It's not, yes. I, I've been there, done it. I've been there, done yeah. it. So I can say, honestly, I know how easy it is to slip into that mindset. Yes. It's like, no, I know I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing this crazy amount of exercise and I'm not eating anything and you convince yourself this is the right thing. Uh, but uh, what happens then to your hormones is they have to adjust and adapt. So they are merely doing their job. Mm -hmm. They're merely, you know, evolution. It's like, okay, we're in a quite bad situation here. This is starvation. Mm -hmm. You know, when back in the day when you couldn't pop to the supermarket and get something to eat, you know, literally you couldn't get food. So the body knows what to do there going to save energy what would you do slow down its metabolism yeah what would you do if, if you're running low in your petrol tank in your car you slow down mm -hmm. right and so that's exactly what the thyroid gland does it slows it down reduces the demand for the resting metabolic rate mm -hmm. so if you look at the blood test now of someone in this situation you will see tsh and t43 all just a little bit low mm -hmm. All of them. Oh, and TSH. So that's strange, isn't it? 
Yes.、Oh. You see, this is the difference. That's what's always confused me. That, that. Well, there we go. We clarified that. So the medical conditions that an un a primary underactive、uh-huh. thyroid primary means that is the problem there in your neck. A primary one means that that is not doing the business. It's not producing the hormones.、Mm-hmm. So TSH will be very high. It will be a pattern like this:、mm-hmm. ones up, ones down, and vice versa if you've got the overactive thyroid.、Right. Ones up, ones down. You know, whichever. And that's it. The pattern of which is up and which is down. That tells you. You see, endocrinology made simple. There、yes. you go. Yes. Right. But the strange thing is, in reds, you will look at that blood test, and it's like, oh, all of them are low. Yeah. I mean, when I say low, they might still be in the range. They could still be within a normal range, but low on the low side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The TSH might be point nine, let's say, right? Yeah. And the T4 will be ten. This is the, in my brain. My range is in in England, right?、Yes. Right, which is low low range. And T3, depending again, there's so many different ranges and units. But you get the gist. Yeah, it might just squeak in there, but all of them will be low. Now that is really weird because、mm-hmm. you know normally there's a good conversation、Go、between、on. the going on between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the thyroid. So that's really weird. And by the way, this is exactly the same pattern. You see, in a woman whose periods have stopped、mm-hmm. with FHA, okay, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, you look at the blood test. What do they say? They say the control hormones FSH and LH, especially LH, will be low range, maybe in range,、mm-hmm. but also the estradiol and progesterone will be low in range. Right. Really weird. Looking at all of them, low, everything、right. is down. If、right. everything is lowish, and this is my other, I'm getting a lot of things that annoy me.、Um, <laughs> This is the other thing that annoys me. You know, people come to me and say, "Well, I've been told by my GP that these blood tests are in the normal range, yeah, and there's nothing wrong, yeah." And we've had all this discussion about, you know, if you haven't got any periods, even if your blood tests are in the normal range, low,、mm-hmm. there is a problem. Sorry, right? That's right.、It. You have to look at the outcome. You know, it's like. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but yeah, so that's the obvious one for. The, but exactly, the, think of it in exactly the same parallel with the thyroid gland.、Mm-hmm. If someone is in reds, I can guarantee you right now that the thyroid hormones will all be a little bit low. Okay,、mm-hmm. and so that distinguishes it from a primary underactive thyroid is because of your your imbalance in your actions, your behaviours. You see, so in that that case, you are not going to give thyroxine. No, no, no. Because you only give thyroxine, remember, if the TSH is raised, right? And you've got absolute evidence that the person needs it. It's not a problem with the thyroid gland. It's just quite sensibly just shut down, reduce the metabolic rate, saving energy, all those words. Okay. Yeah. And so, what are you going to do to reboot the system? It's the same thing that you would say to try and reboot your your periods. Guess what? You've got to rebalance the energy intake, energy expenditure. So it comes back to the same thing, and actually, by improving, getting the metabolic rate back to where it should be, that will also help the female hormones, right, and all the hormone systems. Because it's、right. not, although we've been focusing on the thyroid axis, by the, the way, in the case of red S, it's all the hormones. Guess what?、Yeah. It, it's all of them, and they're they're talking to each other. Yeah. Right. Because they're all under the same boss here in the brain. Right. So it makes sense. I really hope our listeners are taking notes. I have been. <laughs> I've been taking notes, and you just seriously, I just had this huge aha moment because I'm like, this is why I always get confused with my clients when I'm looking、mm. at thyroid because, and I and I know because I do focus a a lot of my clients are in not all of them, but a lot of them are in a state of red S. Yeah. And so I know that these are normal, but it just I go to the textbooks and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. But mo- it's because my textbooks don't cover red S. That's the problem. Well, exactly, because it's a it's a it's a subtle thing because the textbook tends to do med. Medical condition, right, right, and then I'm like, this doesn't line up, and this is a、yeah. this is a functional issue, right, right, right. And if you really like, in in my book, I've got a graph with the the thyroid, what you know, where these zones are, yes, okay, that we've been talking about. If if you're a visual person, you like it,、mm-hmm. but I'm glad that that's clarified that. <laughs> and listen, it, it, listen, you're not alone. Yeah, I mean, I'm afraid to say there are lots of doctors that still, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so.、Um, I'm glad we clarified that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and for me and my approach with clients, anyways, is hey, we're going to solve the the 
you know, if I know that red S is the underlying problem for other reasons, regardless of thyroid, I, it's always for me just interesting of let's keep focusing on the behaviors, the energy balance, yeah, yeah, and it will all come our good. food, yeah. and, and it fix it fixes itself. Yeah, exactly, you know, they get exactly. their blood proof. tested again in yeah. three or six months, and I'm like, okay, there you go. It's yeah, you know, yeah, because it's so reversible, it proof. which is really really yeah. positive, which is the message we want to get across. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a medical condition, um, you know, that's just bad luck. Like I've got rheumatoid. It's just like, you know, whatever, except that's it. You have to do, you have to take, you do have to take the medication. That's it. But this is really empowering what we said just here. Yes. Yeah. That actually, if it's something that you can do, you can change. We're not saying this is easy, as we know, (laughs) the mindsets and everything, but it should be really positive news that you can do something about this and you don't have to resort to, to medications. And, you know, I I really want to hit on that point even further. I really want to drive it home because I think that when people are struggling, they kind of, it's our nature to kind of look for a reason, look for an excuse. We almost want some sort of diagnosis, you know, oh, that makes sense. I have, I must have Hashimoto's or I must have. And, and it, I know that that might feel like, oh, there's a reason, but actually it's, it's better even though you have to take your own personal accountability, actually is better if if the reason, like you said earlier, is is you. <laughs> that you actually need to change your behaviors because you can improve. Yeah. But no, but then you're then you feel better because you're empowered. You're, you're, empowered. you're empowered. I don't have yes. to rely on a medication. Yes. And also the other thing is, Lindsay, I think everyone wants a quick fix, doesn't I do? Yes. You know, if there yeah. was a quick fix to <laughs> reverse rheumatoid, you know what I mean? Let's be frank. If there was right. a quick thing, great. I understand why people want that quick fix, but it's actually much more beneficial and satisfying that you can fix it if yourself. You yes, it might take a little exactly. bit more time. It will take time, but it's, it's worth it because then you'll have gone through that and it's like, yeah, that feels really good. I've sorted that. And also, you know, this resilience. And then in the future, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, I can, if I can deal with that, I can now, I feel really confident. I can deal with other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, it's, it's really helpful. It's, it's, I'm the same way too. Like, yeah, we want answers. We want to know, but if, if the longer route is sometimes harder, but it is more empowering in the end and and really, really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been incredibly insightful. I'm trying to think if I have any further questions. I think just I'll, I'll share one other little tidbit of, you know, Mm -hmm. in my experience working with clients that do have altered thyroid hormones. And, you know, they're also coming to me because there's something wrong with their nutrition. It could be Mm -hmm. red S, disordered eating behaviors, overexercise, things like that. And as I already mentioned, my my role is to focus on Mm -hmm. nutrition, energy, fueling, nourishing your relationship with food, relationship with body. And and then, you know, it's really interesting how hormones can heal and fix themselves when Mm -hmm. you're focusing on your behaviors. But I will say with that said, sometimes both can be at play. You know, you can, ha- you can have not good nutrition and fueling and you could be in red S and maybe also have an autoimmune disease. You know, th- oh, yes, th- sure. there's certainly things that can be overlapping and, and that's where it's just worth exploring all your options, yeah. getting to the root of it, making, pulling in a whole team of experts. You know, you've worked with many of my clients and that's been so helpful that I don't have to kind of stress about they're on a medication. Okay. I'm Dr. K's, you know, monitoring that and that's helpful so i can keep focusing on you know what i do with clients yeah no that's a that's a really important point you know just because you have read it's not saying you you might not have something else medical as it were and also i've been observing i haven't done a proper study on this i'm just wondering even based just on me whether if you've sort of uh been through this does that make you more likely to develop an autoimmune disease so listen interesting we the, the thing i don't know that's just me just throwing it out there i you know yeah uh, as a thought uh, and after all reds is it's you know it's functional hypothalamic and it's functional so it's a diagnosis of exclusion mm-hmm. so absolutely we must we're not going to dismiss people uh, we're going to do the blood test that's why i do the blood test to make sure there isn't a lurking medical thing as well mm-hmm. rare but I picked up one or two things, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, over the years. So that's why, you know, we want to make sure that everything, we're looking at you as an overall person, every little uh, nuance and what's going on. And also there are th- some things for the thyroid gland, uh, you know, we know um, iodine, for example. If you don't have, because iodine is important. I'm not wearing my necklace today, but I've got my, um, oh, actually it's my earrings. I've got T3 and T4 earrings, right? 
And you can see the difference of them because T3 has got three iodine molecules and four and T4 has got four of them. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, ions, iodine ions, if we're going to be technically. Anyway. And you get, where do you get iodine f- uh, from? Well, actually, you're probably <laughs> more expert on this than me, but my general understanding is, you know, iodize table salt and yeah. uh, seafood, which is why apparently historically in Switzerland, where they're landlocked country, they didn't have much access to iodine. So they would, the goiter, they would get goiters. Mm-hmm. The, uh, thyroid gland would swell up because it hadn't got enough iodine to make this. You can actually uh, see it in the neck. It's the thyroid swells up so much. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Bulging out. Exactly. So anyway, you know, there are some little, but I think most people nowadays, you do have enough iodine and there's meant to be some other micronutrients, aren't there, Lindsay, that are helpful for thyroid health. But these are sort of the, the finer bits of it, you know, the little extra pieces. But I think looking at the most important reasons is is the first port of call but just bearing in mind these other nuances as well little things yeah yeah absolutely well well thank you again this was so helpful and i want to give another shout out to your book hormones health and human potential that is out it's on your website it is on amazon as well is it oh yeah it's on amazon okay. i hope that the us amazon sped up uh, because i understand that it was only on kindle although on kindle okay. the diagrams are in color but anyway um, hopefully, hopefully they've got their act together, but if not, and you want, uh, you know, a hard copy as it were, then my publisher, Sokoa Books, also mm-hmm. on my website, uh, they ship internationally. So if you're having, if you want the book itself, uh, then you can, uh, do that as well. But yeah, both links are on my website, uh, either Amazon or direct to the publisher. Yeah. Yeah. And I have the book, a really nicely written book that, you know, yes, you can, you know, look something up if you need to, but really reading it chapter to chapter is quite nice because it really tells a story of of the hormones. Oh, thank you. That's exactly what I wanted it to be. Yeah. I didn't want it to be a textbook. I wanted it, yeah. it is a story. It is a story. It's, uh, it, it's well, uh, you know, that picture that's of me jumping on a beach. And, you know, I wanted to, and you know, my belly link. So that's why it's written in two acts and it's got scenes. So it is a story. But as you say, you can read it any way you want. You can read it like the story or you can dip into bits however you want. And if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of some of the stuff we've discussed today, yeah. rest assured, there are plenty of references in the back. Plenty of references. And yeah. to, your, to your heart's content, look up all those research papers if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And um, I also want to help promote your social media sites where you put out really helpful information and just to tell everybody, because we've had you on other episodes, and so we've shared your social media site, but you had the unfortunate experience of getting your account hacked, so you had to start a new one. So let's yeah. make sure everybody goes and follows your new account. Can you remind us what it is? So the new account, simple, at Dr. Nikki, N-I-C-K-Y-K, spelled K-E-A-Y. So yeah, my other one, old one, Nikki Hay Fitness, got hacked by... Uh, Yes, a male from Turkey, anyway, who blackmailed me. And then just recently, for some reason, he's reactivated it. But I'm just, please don't, you know, so see it. Please, if you have time, please report it because that's not me in control of it. So I don't know what's, I have no guarantee what's going to pop up there. But if you come to my new one, Dr. Nikki K, I am continuing, as you say, Lindsay, I try and, you know, post interesting things, things that are happening now, you know, whatever is the latest uh you know, a thing of interest here in the UK, we have a whole debacle about uh, dosage of HRT, for example. But anyway, yeah, whatever is, is I feel is interesting, I, I plonk on there. And also for consistency across other, you know, Twitter and Facebook, I've just changed it all to Dr. Nikki K. Uh, Dr. Because Nikki then it just K. makes it it's simpler. I mean, my website is still Nikki K Fitness, mm-hmm. but you know, uh, I think website domains are, are no, no, more no, difficult exactly. to change. I know no, me so too. I, so I'm leaving it there. So, you know, hopefully you'll find me one way or the other. Um, yes. or go, go to your, cause all your channels, also your, your linked to me or following me or whatever we reciprocally follow so that, you know, that, that's the other way around. Yeah. yeah. I repost your stuff and in these yeah, show exactly. notes for this episode, I'll include all your correct updated links of the real Dr. Thank you so Nikki much, K. everyone. <laughs> no, well, listen, thank you so much for your support, Lindsay, personally, honestly, really yeah. appreciate it. And to everyone listening today, really, because, you know, you and I, we're in the business of giving people reliable information, supporting them on all that sort of thing. So, you know, we're absolutely on the same page. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to be on, on the same page, on the same team together, helping, yeah, exactly. helping women, active women, exercisers, female athletes. So thank you again. And I'm sure we'll have you back sometime in the future. Absolutely. My pleasure. All the best. 
See ya. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, if you are a true fan of female athlete nutrition, then I would love if you could support our podcast by spreading the word. Share a review on your listening channel. Give us five stars. It really helps get the word out and get the show more views to positively impact others. Also, you can support the podcast by joining our Patreon. Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to consider a donation or even better, join our membership where you get extra monthly content and perks. We don't want you to simply listen alone. We want you to be a part of a community and a movement of fierce, fit, and fueled female athletes. So patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition is where you can do exactly that, learn more, and join. A huge thanks to our affiliates and partners as well. Once again, Prevenix, Inside Tracker, or Gain, Practice Better, Jen and Carrie, please go check them out and their links in the show notes where you can get deals and discounts. Last, be sure that you do more than just listen. If you need help with fueling, it's time to take action. Head to my website to learn more. You can either book a free call with me to learn more about our coaching programs and how we can work directly with you, whether it's the fast track or otherwise. Or you can take our online self-study course, Female Athlete Nutrition. You can literally sign up and gain access right now. You can explore our downloadable products, including the Red S Recovery Guide, High Iron Fueling Guide, Or if you are a coach of a team, check out our brand new coaches toolkit for teams. You can also just learn more. We have a blog, a Red S quiz to see if Red S is affecting you. If you need help, I want you to get help fast. Too many girls and athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer. You can rise up with the power of nutrition, take action today in any of these avenues, and become fierce, fit, and fueled. Links in the show notes, and we'll see you next time.